नमस्ते मे आई रिक्वेस्ट ऑल ऑफ यू टू जस्ट डू आ लिटल मेडिटेशन एक्सरसाइज बिफोर वी टॉक अबाउट वॉट एम आई गोइंग टू से इफ यू डोंट माइंड प्लीज जेंटली क्लोज योर आईज place your body in a comfortably relaxed position alert relax comfortable let your feet be planted in the ground we call the ground the mother earth keep your head neck and back in alignment with each other place your body in a very comfortably relaxed position i would like us to be mindful of our breath as we are breathing in and breathing out become mindful of your breath where you feel your breath clearly it may be in your belly or it may be in your heart center or at the back of your throat in your mouth on your lips or in your nostrils just become aware of the movements of your breath as you are breathing in and breathing out you might notice that when you are breathing in your belly slowly slowly rises and as you are breathing out your belly slowly slowly goes in and just pay your full attention to the movements of your breath the movement of the body the different parts of the body where you feel the breath sensations and let's spend a little time in paying attention to our body body is the gift given to us by god the body is like a temple and we take care of our body by paying our loving kind attention to our body like a mother holding the baby in her hands and we scan the body right from our toes all the way to the top of our head continue breathing in and breathing out become in mindful of your body the sensations without judging in a very compassionate loving and kind way become mindful of various sensations we may experience in our body at this time they may be pleasant or unpleasant 
without passing any judgment, we just attend to lovingly, kindly, the sensations that we experience in our body at this time. Become aware of the flow of energy when we are paying attention to our body in a loving, kind, non-judgmental way. There is a flow of energy that we experience in our body. So just gently pay attention to your body. Become aware of the flow of energy right from your toes going through different parts of your body all the way to the top of your head. As we are going through this process becoming mindful of our breath, the bodily sensations. And if a thought arrives at this time, just pay attention to your thought. We breathe in and let the thought come. And we breathe out and let the thought go. We are not resisting our thoughts, chasing them, getting stuck with them. We just non-judgmentally pay attention to our thoughts. Let a thought come, breathe in, and let a thought go, breathe out. Let's spend a minute or so in just going through this process like your mind is minding the mind now without getting stuck. And just remain aware of what is happening in your mind without holding on to a thought or running away from your thought, or fighting your thought. And as we are going through this process mindfully, become aware of any emotion or feeling that may arise, just like a thought. We breathe in and let it come fully. And we breathe out and let it go fully. Let's pay attention to our eyes. Research shows that 80% of our energy is used up by our eyes. So let's be mindful of our eyes in a loving, caring, non-judgmental way. Let our eyes settle down slowly, slowly, because we are not using our eyes at this time. Become mindful of the changes taking place in our eyes as our eyes are settling down slowly, slowly, 
slowly. The first change I invariably notice that when my eyes are settling down and I let my eyes settle down on their own, the first change I notice that the movements in my eyes are slowly, slowly fading away on their own. As my eyes are settling down and the movements in my eyes are fading away, I notice another change taking place on its own. The tension in my eyes is slowly, slowly melting away. And my eyes are getting more and more relaxed. As my eyes are settling down, getting somewhat quieter and calm and still, getting more and more relaxed, I notice another sensation arising on its own in my eyes. And my eyes are slowly, slowly getting softer and softer tender, softer. As my eyes are settling down, slowly, slowly, the movements in my eyes are fading away slowly, slowly. The tension in my eyes is going away slowly, slowly, slowly. I sense the softening of my eyes. And I sense the flow of energy flowing in my eyes. And as I am sitting, becoming mindful of my eyes, The clarity dawns in my eyes and the eyes become clear, the quiet eyes, the relaxed eyes, the soft eyes, are clear eyes. Before we conclude this short guided meditation, become aware of how your energy is flowing at this time. Notice the shift that takes place in our body, in our breath, in our mind, in the heart. And when you are ready, when you want to open your eyes, gently open your eyes and remain centered for a short time before we say anything or do anything. Thank you. Namaste. This is what I do every day. And this is mindfulness. Where my mind is right here, not going there or everywhere, right here, in the present moment. Now it is difficult to do that because mind has a tendency to wander. Right? So, 
how many of you if you are not concerned about raising your hand but please raise your hand how many of you felt your mind was right here you were right here yeah how many of you felt your mind kind of taking a little hike going somewhere here there that happens to most of us because the mind has a tendency to jump from one place to another place and in mindfulness meditation we don't judge our mind taking a hike <laughs> we just accept it that's mindfulness non acceptance come from judgment isn't that so when i judge why my mind is going here and there that's kind of a angry judgmental thought the mindfulness says if a thought goes here or there and any if emotion arises in you something from the past or you worry about something or whatever let it come if you don't hold on to it what will happen it just goes away it just goes away so that is one thing about mindfulness and i have given you a handout so you can read the definition of mindfulness and i'll talk about that also but this is something which i do every day i am 92 years old i have never been hospitalized no medical condition and people ask me what the secret so i will tell you the secret if you pay me 100 dollars maybe 50 the secret is very simple that's mindfulness when i was 18 years old i was tutoring to make both ends meet i was born in a poor family so i had to be on my own <laughs> and i was going to the college so i said i need to have some money to make both ends meet and my parents were very not not very rich so we have all kind of struggling so i was do, doing teaching tutoring in india we have this tutorial system so you go to the house of a rich person and the person gives us some money and that's the way it goes that's nice i'm very thankful to have people who really want to extend their help and to help me to for my education and usually it's about 50 minutes session but sometimes it will be 1 hour and 5 minutes and the parents of the children would say you have another place to go and it's already time when i am fully engaged with something totally time becomes timeless time becomes timeless space becomes spaceless these are all spiritual concepts in all spiritual traditions wisdom traditions that i have studied that's one of the ways in which whatever word we may use for that the supreme being in our culture we use the word brahman which has no name beyond space beyond time i consider them divine moments these are the moments i'm fully engaged fully engaged and there is a flow i don't look at the watch though i should because time is important right so there is a reality that we may not stay here until 12 o'clock midnight so we have to be realistic that's true but how do we not be bound by the time 
is an important challenge. So when I go through this process of meditation or engaging myself in something that I fully get absorbed in, I go into that timeless, spaceless zone. In Zen system, it is called, you are in the zone. <laughs> you are in the zone. And there are two words that are important, human being, right? We are human beings, correct? Is there anybody who is not a human being here? Then that person should go to the mental hospital. Yeah, human beings. The wonderful thing about that, I'm human, but I'm also, I have that being. So we have a having and doing zone. I have this, this is my body, I'm here, I'm thirsty, I'm drinking water. I'm a man, you are a woman. Oh, I look more handsome than you. you know, look at me, I'm sharper than you, I'm more intelligent than you, I'm more qualified than you, I'm richer than you, I'm famous, more rich, fame, 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 etc. And that's human part, that's human part. And the human part has conflicts. And the human part goes through joy and frustration. The joy is not forever. After a while, the joy goes away and something happens. So this is the human part. Now, God has given us the being part. The being part is that part which can really help me to remain centered, focus in the present moment. That's the being part. The being part really helps me to be calm and quiet. The being part is that part that makes me whole. And the being part is that part that makes me feel at home. I am at home. This is very, very important uh, from my perspective to understand. Once I listened to a very wonderful medical doctor by the name Dean Ornish, some 30 years ago when I was little younger. And I was really touched by what he said. And he said he was in medical school and uh, he was like a out-of-box kind of student, right? <laughs> he would not agree with everything that the professor says, well, let us inquire. How come? Why is that so? Why is that? There is another way of looking at it. So he was kind of a troublemaker. But I like those kinds of students as a professor. I was a professor once upon a time. I like those students who really say, hey, I don't agree with you, I say. Let me understand why you don't agree with me. What's your point of view? It, does that make sense? That's what it is. That's what learning and becoming wise. So I listened to him and as a student, he was invited to go to a party. And he said, well, it's, well, Gautam goes to college. He likes party, to go to party, right? I like to go to party too. So party is a fun time. So he goes there and he was surprised to see a yogi in orange clothes. His name was Swami Satchidananda, one of the greatest yoga teachers that I have come across. Swami Satchidananda. Satchidananda is the word in which we describe divinity. Sat, being present to what is. Chit, calm and clear consciousness. Ananda, pure joy and bliss. His name was Satchidananda. Sat, Chit, Ananda. Sat means the truth. This is the truth. Where I am, the present moment, 
is the only moment moment that is full this is the moment the magical moment the mystical moment whatever word we may use for that this is the present moment it has its own fullness unless i get away from the present moment then there is a fracturing that takes place in my mind so he was there and he was requested to give a talk so this doctor dean ornish who was a student at that time and in the talk the swami sachidanand says human beings human being has become human doing very profound wise statement really i was really like aha that kind of wow aha don't we sometimes feel that aha i mean the light was lamp was lit up in me like eureka <laughs> ah like that we feel that there are moments in our life when we really wake up from our own deep sleep ah i was really awakened it really shed light i say i started thinking about it that how much time we spend and energy in doing 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 even the mind when it gets into why am i sitting here so you have started doing that kind of mind doing <laughs> when the mind is not present the mind is doing 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 usually thinking about the past you know uh, why did that girl didn't like me gautam sounds familiar sometimes right to young people that happens it happened to me that happens to us everybody doesn't like me all the time do i like me all the time yeah i like myself. i like myself yeah I like myself. Yes, I have that kind, tender feelings about me. My like my mom. My mom would accept me no matter. I was little mischievous. Says you are still my child. <laughs> and I would cry and say cry for a while, but you are still my child. And I would smile and say you are still my child. I was tired and she says you are still my child. I was fresh and say you are still my child. that's the way i accept myself if i am tired i am tired mindfulness if i am upset i recognize i am upset and i have learned from yoga system that when i am upset my dad taught me to pay attention to my breath what happens when you are upset tell me what happens to your breath come on all of you know that chest yeah, shallow yeah shallow little bit fast breathing chest breathing chest breathing is tiring breathing why because when we are facing something that causes anger in us or fear in us oh, i don't know what to do the sympathetic nervous system in the brain because we have autonomic nervous system the sympathetic nervous system in the brain gets highly activated and secretes stress hormones which affects our immune system that's one of the secrets why i am 92 and healthy one of the secrets it doesn't mean that i may not get angry because i am a human being but i have that being part in me <laughs> the being part really ah i am listening to you so this part becomes quiet the human part becomes quiet and my dad had taught me that when you get angry or fearful or frustrated or not in the zone pay attention to your breath and he was a good teacher because as a child i would get upset sometimes because things did not go the way my way so i would get why not frustrated angry and my dad instead of saying don't get angry he said 
Pay attention to your angry, yeah. Pay attention to your breath. And just breathe in and breathe out. I'm not denying my frustration and anger. I'm not running away from it. I'm not resisting it. I'm not chasing it. I'm right here and now. I'm mindful. Breath is a link between the mind and the body. That's what the yoga system has taught us. It's a link between the mind and the body. Now, when I start doing belly breathing, diaphragmatic breathing or abdominal breathing, the parasympathetic nervous system gets activated. This is wonderful. God has given a wonderful structure in the body and the mechanism. That's what happens. Your parasympathetic nervous system gets activated and this system starts going down and then a balancing act takes place. Yoga means also balance. That's why we do right and left and balance, uh, balance our body. Don't we do that? It's quite interesting. God has given us two things, you know, two hands and two eyes and two nostrils and two legs. Right? So balancing. But that's what happens. So when I use the word mindfulness, it's not simply sitting and meditating, which is wonderful. But also we get a lot of opportunities to use our mindfulness. Isn't that so? Because we are human beings. <laughs> That's what Dean Ornish mentioned, that human beings, we have become human doing. So he ex exactly said that our dharma, we use the word dharma, our dharma, our task, our work, our duty is to make it sure that we take care of ourselves. We become centered, focused, mindful. So Dean Ornish was so much impressed by that and he said, Swami Yogi, where are you? He said, I have an ashram on the East Coast. Can I come? He said, come after you finish your study. <laughs> I don't want to come in the way. But he was inspired. He got his MD and, of course, went to study yoga, meditation. He is one of the groundbreaking research doctors who has reversed the heart condition of the people without medication the groundbreaking research he has done. I would encourage you to read his book. Now it's available on Amazon.com. I checked that. Go to Kindle, $8.20. Not very expensive. It's one of the books that I would encourage you to read. And in that book, the research shows that when you really do become mindful of your own stress, mindful of all the thoughts that are going through your mind and takes you here and there and causes all this energy blocking, blocks in our energy. This is the time to become mindful. Now, becoming mindful takes only a couple of minutes. You don't have to spend 10 minutes to check, how is my breath? Then you have a real problem. How much time it takes to check your breath? How are we breathing at this time? Can you check? How are you breathing? Can you put your hand on your belly? When you breathe in, your belly rises. When you breathe out, your belly goes in. That's wonderful. You are becoming centered. You are bringing our energy in the center, not going here and there. There is a flow. So when I was 18 years old, I knew my call, what's my purpose. In mindfulness, that's considered a very important point. Purpose. That's why in the definition also, John Kabat-Zinn says that. On purpose. 
when we go through mindfulness experiences, meditation and mindfulness practices, we find our own voice. We don't hear our voice because there is a lot of noise going on in our mind. So quiet mind is very important. How do we do that? This simple breathing exercise, being present. So I knew my call. My call was to be a teacher. That was my call. Nobody, I didn't go to a counselor to find out whom I should be. I listened to my own voice and the joy I was experiencing in doing what I was doing. This is my cup of tea. This is my, how much money I was making? Very low. Teachers, unfortunately, healthcare practitioners are not paid much, enough. Unfortunately, in all countries of the world except few that I'm familiar with. Because unfortunately, we are a totem pole, you know, on a lower level. So I didn't care whether I was making this much money or that much money. I was listening to my being. And that helped me to go through my education. I never paid tuition for my education. I always got scholarship until I came to America. I got Fulbright scholarship, one of the most difficult, prestigious award. Went to the University of Chicago to study. I enjoyed learning thoroughly. So I'm just sharing my experience with you here that I really need to listen to my voice, inner voice. And for that, I really need to go inside myself. It's from inside out, really. I really need to go inside myself, listen to my voice, become quiet, and right answer, wisdom, right choice making comes from that quiet place from within ourselves. So there was a great anthropologist, American cultural anthropologist by the name Joseph Campbell. I was very fond of him. And in one of the books, <clears throat> he uses a phrase that is now has become cliche, follow your bliss. Follow your bliss. And as a professor, he was, he was a great professor and he would spend time with each and every student. And then when the student says something and he would watch the student and when there is a spark, when the eyes sparkle, the professor say, ah, that's your cup of tea. <laughs> that's you want to be, that's you want to follow. And he kept a record of those students and they were the happiest students who really followed their bliss, followed their bliss. Does this make sense to you? And this journey went on and on, my life. So, I went for my second doctoral degree. And when I talked to my wife, she said, are you crazy? You have already PhD from the University of Chicago and why do you want to go for your another doctoral degree? This came from within myself. And I say, I'm in one of the greatest, richest countries in the world. But how come I don't see much happiness? I talk to people, they say, well, I have this and that, but I don't seem to be very happy. So I was wondering about it, that why? Then I had some Indian medical doctors and I said, why are you just prescribing medication uh, for heart conditions and for blood pressure and for diabetes? Why do you do that? Well, that's the way I was trained. I said, I'm not criticizing you, but are there other ways of helping your patients? And say, what are the other ways? Just ask me, what am I doing? I don't have blood pressure. I don't have diabetes. I don't have heart condition. I don't have liver problem. No, I don't. 
I don't get headaches. I still have my hair. <laughs> so the question was, how come? And I said, it's very simple. So there are four dimensions I was interested in. The first dimension is the body. That's why when we went through the guided meditation, I said, let's pay attention to our body. <coughs> and if you really pay attention to your body, then you know when your body is tired. Then we go to sleep at that time. Rather than, no, let me just run for a couple of miles or so and so forth. I'm tired. The body has its own intelligence. There was a great professor at Harvard University some hundred years ago, Walter Cannon. And he wrote a book, Wisdom of the Body. As a medical doctor, Wisdom of the Body. The body has its own intelligence. Think about it, how we, the digestion takes place, right? I mean, the brain works. It's just a wonderful thing. The structure and mechanism is so wonderful. The body has its own intelligence, natural intelligence, not IQ. I'm not talking about IQ here. Wisdom, that's the word that Walter Cannon uses. The body has its own wisdom. If I listen to my body, <laughs> your mother or father may have a lot of wisdom, but if you don't listen to, the wisdom doesn't help you. So this is a very important point, is the physical dimension the brain dimension, neurological dimension. It's very important because we have a brain. We have also another brain, which is called gut brain, which is very important, more important than just this brain, called gut brain. Don't we say gut level feeling, my gut feeling is this? Because gut tells you. It's more like intuitive feeling. Sometimes you feel inside yourself, well, that's not, I don't want to go there. And you listen to your intuition. So intuition comes from that gut level, gut brain. So the body is very important. So it's a very simple thing that I do for my body and I request my doctors to sometimes spend time with the patients that say, what are you eating? The great Greek Hippocrates taught us food is medicine. Am I mindful of what I'm eating? Very simple, right? The energy comes from food. What kind of food am I eating? Am I eating that food that causes, that disturbs my body system, disturbs my heart, disturbs my stomach, disturbs my liver, causes headache, affects my nose? Body is connected with the food. Very important. So that's simple, but I'm very careful about what food I'm eating. And when I eat, I listen to my belly rather than tongue. When I listen to my body, that's enough. The food is very delicious. My daughter-in-law says, have a little bit more. She is very wonderful. She takes care of me like I am her dad. I said, a little bit. No, I said, thank you very much. I'm full. Listening to the body, the body, the belly has its own intelligence. It tells us, hey, take it easy. So if I go against the voice of my belly, what am I, what is going to happen? I will have trouble in my body, belly. My sleep will be disturbed. I may have to take several tums and so on and so forth. So I'm putting more and more chemicals in my body there. I'm going against nature. So mindfulness of what am I eating? How am I eating? I am the slowest eater in the family. Everybody eats faster than me. I eat very mindfully. That means I taste and savor the food that I'm eating. Now if I eat like this, I'm done. My son-in-law in Phoenix is the fast eater. And I said, do you remember what you ate? <laughs> Good question to us. Did you, did you, did you, can you tell me how it tasted? Well, it was food. I know it was food, but 
you know the subtleties and the beauty of food is lost if i just keep on eating fast so that's mindfulness does that make sense so mindfulness is not just sitting doing meditation which is wonderful but how can be i be mindful in all context of my life what do i eat do i do exercise if i don't do exercise my body is going to be affected by that i don't do i don't have a physical fitness center i have never been a member of that because some people become member and don't go but i walk for 30 minutes every day and walking has created a good foundation because when i was a, a child in my country there were no means of tra- i'm talking about 92 years so three generations i was in a, there was no running water we had fetch water you know from the well there was no electricity uh, it was all natural there was no world like organic food at that time everything was organic <laughs> there was i had never heard the word organic because there was everything was organic so i'm making a point here i used to walk because the school was about uh, a mile and a half and i would walk so i have developed a good foundation i still walk enjoy walking does that make sense so i don't have to have gadgets to really take care of myself i don't need to i'm not against gadgets please don't get me wrong but the body has its own wonderful way of taking care of it if i become mindful and wise so that's body when my body is tired i go to sleep i don't say well how about half an hour more no my body is tired thank you very much for giving me a message i am here listening i am listening to you mindfully <laughs> mindful listening <coughs> is paying full attention to that's mindfulness paying full attention to what is happening in the present moment is mindfulness without judging now if i am tired and if i don't listen to my body and i say no i should really uh, do this at this time i have to write a paper i should write a paper i have already started judging myself for not taking care of myself that's a problem problem so i go to bed at 10:30 and wake up at 5:30 in the morning wonderful when i wake up i am very fresh because my sleep is wonderful before i sleep i take care of this little body scan the body gets relax a relaxed body has wonderful the intelligence of the body keeps the body wonderful sound sleep so when i wake up nobody has to say hmm wake up i just wake up <laughs> i just wake up then i am also very mindful as i say of my breath i am also very mindful of my mind if you have studied buddhism 2500 years ago gautam buddha my friend's name is gautam gautam buddha was very much interested in understanding why do we suffer that was his quest and and in his quest he found that the clinging the craving holding on to causes suffering so don't we have craving don't we have desire of course we have desire when there is good food i say well it looks good let me have it so desire is there i mean desire makes us move really if there was no desire there is no movement <laughs> right but my the mindfulness says that who is controlling you is your desire controlling you or you are controlling your own desire <laughs> this is an important question mindfulness creates freedom within us it frees us from our own selves i'm not talking about freeing from somebody else freeing myself from my own self that means when i go on the wrong path walk mindful mindlessly 
that's where the mindfulness comes into play mindfulness comes into play so it helps me to pay attention to on which path i am walking so buddha's search was that how why do we suffer and one of the words in pali language is he preached his gave sermon in pali that language derived from sanskrit i know sanskrit and i have studied sanskrit but pali is derived from sanskrit and the word that he use is very profound word tanna tanna tushna getting attached to my desire attachment is the problem if my hand is open i hold it but then i hold it more and more and more and more and more make a bigger fist what happens my hand gets tired my hand gets tired so it's very important to be mindful the word mindfulness that we use in buddhism it's called sati that's mindfulness what is the word sati means what is pay attention to what is not what should be but could be what is and that happens when our mind is focused and quiet that is a wonderful contribution and he makes some very powerful profound statements and he uses the word which is similar to the mindfulness we are talking about kind of a mindfulness helps us to become wise so he uses the word <laughs> samyak samyak means wise right samyak s a m y a k samyak means right wise samyak vichar right thoughts right thoughts samyak vichar samyak vaani right speech right speech because i can hurt you by the speech i use isn't that so buddha believed in not hurting people if you are familiar with yoga sutra of patanjali he says the same thing these are all great spiritual teachers say the same thing and he uses the word ahinsa hinsa means hurt ahinsa means not hurting how do i hurt myself how do i hurt others mindful <laughs> do we hurt ourselves do we hurt others it may not be a physical hurt it can be an emotional hurt a verbal hurt or even thinking about hurting somebody <laughs> sometimes we hurt the person before we see the person in our mind <laughs> i'm going to take care of him <laughs> that sob whatever <laughs> i mean mind really jogs mind jogs and in jogging all these thoughts come all these thoughts according to buddha according to mindfulness are very destructive thoughts violent thoughts so mindfulness is exactly that i become mindful of my thoughts i become mindful of my emotions i become mindful of my emotions then the buddha says another thing become mindful of your right livelihood <laughs> if people were earning money honestly the whole world will be rich nobody will be poor because we have enough of resources enough of resources enough wealth we have but if i earn money <laughs> dishonestly which unfortunately even rich people do that then according to buddha it's going to bring suffering to you very simple very simple so become mindful become mindful so i sometimes 
take several detours, which I took, right? I was talking about why in the world I wanted to have another doctor degree. Almost you, you guys forgot too, you did not tell me. <laughs> <laughs> but sometimes we get carried away, right? That happens. So now let me go back to what I was saying. So the question was, why in the world did I go for my second doctoral degree in clinical psychology? So I went to a, the professional school of, Illinois School of Professional Psychology, which was giving PsyD, MA and PsyD in clinical psychology. So I go there and the dean said, are you looking for a part-time job here? Because at the age of 56, who would like to go to school and get for, go for another doctoral degree? And he said, no, I'm here, I want to be a student. And he said, you, in your application, you say you already have one PhD, and why do you want to do have another doctoral degree? I'm, she said, I'm very curious. I said, let me say why. I'm glad that you are curious now. So the reason why I wanted to do my degree in clinical psychology, because I think the East has given some very, very powerful tools of taking care of the body, taking care of the mind, to walk on the spiritual path, to walk on the right path. And the West, historically, has created industrial revolution. No industrial revolution started in the East, no. Industrial revolution, huge productions, huge consumptions, highly advanced in science and technology. Yes, that's what I learned when I went to the University, went to the University of Chicago, how to do research. It's very important to do research, how to do research. I study about brain, what is the function of the brain. Because very important, very important to learn. So the East has contributed something, the West has contributed something. So I wanted East and West to meet. That's the reason. So I will have to take many, some courses. So I will take those courses. They may not be that much interesting and important, but it's required, right? So I'll take them. So, but I say, I'm going to do research. On that basis, you please admit me. Say, what is your research? The research is, I'm going to take people who have, you know, right now also, people have anxiety disorder. Anxiety disorder is very common. The other is people get very angry, you know, sometimes shoot, sometimes do crazy things. So anger, hostility, that's another thing I want to work on. And then I want to work on at this time, at that time and probably this time too, uh, heart condition is number one. Heart problem is number one in our country. Maybe cancer is catching up. So I want to focus on medical conditions and psychological conditions. And I want to use Eastern approaches to work on this and use all the technology that is available here at the University of Chicago, I use the medical center. So it is a lot of wonderful help I got. And I want to check their heart rate and, you know, blood pressure and give them tests, psychological tests to check their anxiety level, anger, frustration, stress level. And say, oh, that's fine, that sounds good, so let me do that. So that's the research I did. And in the research I used three components, all mindfulness components. The first thing that I did, which I practice even now, is taking care of my body. Becoming mindful of my body and taking care of my body. The second, which was very important, is checking my medical conditions. 
you know, heart rate, right? Blood pressure, these are important variables for the heart condition. So I want to check that. Which Western, country, Western science is very helpful, technology is very helpful. Then I want to teach them simple stretching exercises. Mindfulness-based stretching exercises, not heavy-duty yoga exercises. Mindfulness-based stretching exercises, mindfulness-based Tai Chi exercises, breathing, and mindfulness presence, being here. So that's what I did. For eight weeks, I worked with those people who had heart conditions. For eight weeks, they were very, very, very much committed to their own health. And I kept on record every week. And I gave them machines to, they can check their heart rate and blood pressure. After eight weeks, the results showed there was a significant change in their medical conditions. I kept in touch with the doctors because I didn't want to come in the medicine they were taking. I kept in touch with the doctors and I told the doctors that after some time, you, you please reduce your dose because these people will not need that much medicine. And some, some of the people who participate didn't need to take medication. But the medication, the dose was significantly reduced. They also said that when we go home, uh, people noticed that we were very happy to be at home. <laughs> people said our headaches are going away. People said that where we work, they think, they say that, well, you seem to be changing somewhat. You know, you are looking forward to coming and you want to work with us and cooperate, work like a team. All those changes can take place when we really practice something which I call mindfulness. Numerous studies have been made, numerous, which support, demonstrate that if you really practice consistently, not, I'm so glad that you are here to listen to the talk, but I hope that you practice what you are learning, even sitting quietly and breathing, closing your eyes, paying attention to your body, paying attention to your mind, what's happening without judging for 10 minutes. Keep a record. Find out, send me your data, say, wow, my sleep is better. I'm feeling a little bit more happy. People like me more. <laughs> Even the dog follows me. <laughs> this is what happens, simple, very simple. So I'm giving you this information and information by itself doesn't bring transformation. Because there is an information, information explosion. <laughs> I look at my internet and so many people send me so many wonderful things, you know. And some people say that in five minutes you will be enlightened, right? The quick fix. <laughs> I don't think I can be enlightened. I'm not a Buddha. So I cannot be enlightened in five minutes, though there is a potential in me to be enlightened. Of course, I have that being part. Of course, I'm a human being, I have that being part. So it is very important for, I'm sharing this with you to encourage you. So when I come here after some months, <laughs> this is the place where I come in summertime. And my daughter, she has a Montessori school. Uh, Paula mentioned that I'm a teacher, consultant, 
uh, in the Montessori school and she has 300 children. We start with the infants, three months old, according to Montessori's way. We take care of the children and almost until the 10th grade, we are going to go to the 12th grade. Now again, my daughter is a good example of listening to her call. So she was in Chicago studies here where I was teaching Governor State University and she studied there and for she fell in love with a young gentleman uh, who is from another religion. He is Catholic and I am Hindu. To me, heart is the place of spirituality. <laughs> If there is love, that's spiritual. Whether it's a Muslim, Buddhist, <coughs> Hindu, Christian, Jewish, Jain, name it. <laughs> that's the way I did not fall in love. I don't fall in love. I loved somebody. <laughs> the same way. I married a lady who comes from another caste another religion, another class, there was no reason for us to get together. And of course, the father didn't like it because I was poor. The father was very rich. I'm Hindu, Jain, business caste, Brahmin. So there was all reasons not for us to get connected with each other. What made me get connected with her? I was 21 years old teaching in a high school and her brother was my student in ninth grade. And he was very famous of kicking tutors out because he didn't like to study. So he requested the father and mother and his sister that I, and I'm not bragging, but I was a great teacher, wonderful teacher. The students loved me. So he said, here is a teacher. I would like him to work as a tutor. So the father said, okay. So I went for an interview, of course. We are interviewed. It's a big house. The father was sitting, and beside the father, his daughter was sitting. And I'm being interviewed. I'm only 21 years old. The father, you know, asked some practical questions, you know, and so on and so forth. And my wife at that time, she was not my wife, of course, one Leela, her name is one Leela. One Leela means beauty of the forest. That's what it means. And she asked me a question. Say, I have a question. I said, what's your question? I said, how come you look so relaxed and happy? <laughs> Simple question. I said, this woman is somebody. <laughs> There's something in her. I got connected with her in a short time. Short time. I didn't fall in love with her. <laughs> there was no falling in love with her. But there is a connection that takes place. Connection. That connection took place in that short encounter. And the seed was planted and it blossomed into a tree. And we became very good friends, strong interest in meditation, music, literature. She would never show up though she was very rich. And we found that we have found each other. So there was a meeting of the heart. The father didn't like it because I was too poor. So for four years, you are not going to see him. That be the test that you really love him. There was a four years I didn't see her, but she was in my heart. Person doesn't go away from the heart at the center of love. I always felt her presence, though she was not with me. Does that make sense? 
it happens you always feel the presence in your heart if you keep your heart open it is called awakened heart that's the buddhist word awakened heart your heart is jagrata open awakened when the heart is awakened it's beyond time and space beyond time and space and there was that deep connectedness that continued eventually she said now is the time for me to go the parents were not in agreement so she eloped a runaway bride <laughs> <laughs> i'm talking about 1954 india usually have caste marriages within the same caste usually arranged marriages love marriage is uh, not many now it's happening so there was every reason for i mean she she from her heart came to a very poor family no complaints no regrets every day was a wonderful day every day was a loving day every day was a compassionate day that's mindfulness and heartfulness there are two concepts that come from buddhist tradition in mindfulness one is mind mental thoughts etc and the other is heart heart is the center of love and compassion according to buddhism both are necessary it's like two wings of the same bird one wing the other wing you have to let the thoughts come to you and the emotions come to you but you do that compassionately <laughs> you become compassionate to your own self you become kind to your own self i cannot be compassionate to you if there is no compassion in me for me how can i love you if i don't love me does that make sense how can i how can i give you if i don't have it in me so this is not like one against the other this is like two hands coming together two wings of the bird two wings it's called loving awareness loving compassionate awareness i'm aware of what is happening what thoughts are going through my mind what feelings are going through my mind but i relate to all these things compassionately kindly non judgmentally accepting them not fighting not resisting not getting stuck with not grabbing not holding on to that's called inner freedom so mindfulness really creates what i consider genuine authentic inner freedom we also use the word light there are some prayers in hinduism which are ancient prayers one of the prayers is asato ma sadgamaya tamaso ma jyotir gamaya mrutyor ma amrutam gamaya om shanti 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 asato ma sadgamaya please it's like a request to god please lead me from untruth to truth sat chit anand <laughs> untruth to truth from unreal to real asato ma sadgamaya tamaso ma jyotir gamaya from the darkness to light from the darkness to light from non awakening to awakening brutyor ma amrutam gamaya please lead me from the fear of dying to the place of immortality in god's place there is immortality in the world's place there is mortality 
we are all here to die someday. So it's a very important, important, because I, when I do counseling, and especially when you know, the husband passes away or the wife passes away, I mean, these are big losses we go through. My wife passed away five years ago, and uh, losses are difficult, especially important people in our life. They go away 60 years of relationship, and she passed away. So I became very sad. I felt the loss, but at the same time, I felt the fullness. Now, it's kind of a paradoxical thing. I felt her presence like I felt for four years. I still feel her presence in my heart. Nobody goes away from our heart unless we say bye-bye. Nobody. Nobody. Nothing goes away. So what am I keeping in my heart? What am I keeping in my mind? What kind of stuff I'm putting in my mind? That's mindfulness. If I keep on holding on to the grudge, then that's causing me tension and stress in me, the emotional stress. And the body and mind are connected. So if I hold on to the emotional stress, it's going to affect my heart. If I suppress my anger, it's going to affect my stomach. Mind and body are connected. So if I become mindful of my body, I'm helping the mind. If I become mindful of my mind, I'm helping the body. If I become mindful of myself, my relationship with Gautam, he calls me grandpa, right? He, I'm not his really grandpa. Do I look like him grandpa? No. But he calls me J.P. Dada, his grandpa. He has become my grandson. I have so many grandchildren now. <laughs> when I go to school, the children call me grandpa, doctor, white hair, <laughs> <laughs> Dr. J.P., they, they, whatever comes to their mind. And I teach peace education based on mindfulness. And it's just amazing to see how these children, including the middle school students, they just love. And love comes from that heartfulness and mindfulness. Heartfulness and mindfulness. That's the center of love. And clear thinking. Clear thinking, compassion, loving, awareness. I will stop here. And if you have questions to ask, this is the time to do that. Thank you very much for being here today, Guruji. Um, uh, one of the things that you have taught us as uh, Hindus is that uh, the moment we wake up in the morning is a very sacred moment. Yes. So there is this prayer that we pray mm -hmm. and we look at our hands. Yes. So this is a very meaningful thing to us, right? Yes. And I would like you to share your experience and uh, this wonderful prayer that your father taught, uh, taught mm -hmm. you and you still repeat day after day. Would mm -hmm. you please share with us? Mm -hmm. Thank you. I appreciate your question and what you are asking me to do. Um, this is a very, very moving experience for me. Uh, my father always would get up early in the morning and I'm following into his footsteps, getting up early in the morning. And whenever he would get up early in the morning, my father would say this chant, which is 700 years old. It's by a great, great thinker, philosopher, teacher by the name Shankaracharya, coming from Kerala, South India, Shankaracharya. He renounced at the age of seven Ask mother, please let me go. And at the age of 30, he passed away, leaving a wonderful treasure behind. Even in short time, there was a gigantic work did. So my father was very fond of Shankaracharya. And this is the chanting that he used to do in the morning, which I do too. So chanting is like this. Pratasmarami Rudi Samus Puritatma Tatvam 
सचेत सुखम परम हंस गति तुरीय यवापन जागर सुषु तम वेति नित्यम तद्रह्म निष्कलम हम न चूत संग एवरी मॉर्निंग वेन आई वेकअप let me remember that the energy that vibrates in my heart is the same energy that vibrates in the heart of the whole cosmos that's the first powerful statement pratas mara virudhi sanspurita atma tatvam satchit sukham param hamsa gatim turiyam when i really wake up and feel the energy that vibrates in my heart which connects me with the whole cosmos i lose my individual identity and i become a cosmic being timeless spaceless pratasmara virudisan spurita atma tatvam satchit sukham param hamsa gatim turiyam when i am in that zone like a zen system i am in that zone the being zone it fills my heart with infinite joy infinite joy sat chit anand anand joy because i am connecting myself with sat my mind my consciousness is pure and clear यत स्वप्न जागर सुषुप्तम अवयति नित्यम दैट कॉस्मिक एनर्जी दैट कॉस्मिक हैंड दैट कॉस्मिक हार्ट टेक्स केयर ऑफ मी इन माय फोर स्टेट्स ऑफ कॉन्शियसनेस एंड द फर्स्ट स्टेट ऑफ कॉन्शियसनेस इज अवर ऑर्डिनरी वेकफुल स्टेट ऑफ कॉन्शियसनेस राइट यू आर आई एम टॉकिंग यू आर लिसनिंग टू मी यू आर यूजिंग योर माइंड एंड यू आर wondering you are say wow whatever <laughs> going through your mind that's our and sometimes this is mine and this is yours and you know at and divisiveness and you know people fight and turmoil and so on and so forth that's our ordinary wakeful state of consciousness the second wakeful state of consciousness when i go to sleep and whatever i have not fulfilled during my wakeful state of consciousness shows up in my dream state of consciousness to such an extent i may fight with somebody the person may not be around me <laughs> i have i have i counsel and sometimes you know the the wife would say my husband you know really was screaming when i was sleeping and i say why because in his there is a dream like he was screaming at his wife <laughs> the screaming unfinished business we try to finish in the in that consciousness then there is a third state of consciousness which is deep sleep it's just different from meditation meditation is just like that deep state of consciousness in meditation we are awake <laughs> in deep state of consciousness we are sound asleep so the insight and the illumination arises doesn't arise in deep state of consciousness it's only in a meditative state of consciousness the insight arises the luminosity arises the illumination arises something is evoke that is called fourth state of consciousness it runs through all the three state of consciousness and beyond that's why it is called transcendental state of consciousness transcendental that's the fourth state of consciousness and shankaracharya says that's me that's me <laughs> that pure transcendental state of consciousness that's me that's me so what is the three states of consciousness kind of illusion <laughs> kind of illusion and we get so much caught up in that bubble of illusion and we think that this is real this is real this is real it's real but in a little way <laughs> this is true it is true in a little way 
So when the mind is really quiet, that's what Shankaracharya taught us. That if you really want to get connected with your own being, which is your cosmic being, the little self becomes the big self. <laughs> and we get liberated and free from the bondages that we ourselves create. The bondages don't come from outside. We create our own cage. <laughs> And we live in that cage. So we need to learn how to fly out from the cage. And that's what it is. And that's what is me and not this collection of the body. And the second prayer came from my mom. I was very fond of my mom. I respected my dad. I loved him, but mother's love is different. <laughs> So, mother's love is really different. I can be really myself with her. And then in the morning she would say, Karagre Vasate Lakshmi Karamat Karamule Saraswati Prabhate Karadarshanam Karagre Vasate Lakshmi Kalamure Karamule Saraswati Karamadhyetu karma Govindaha Prabhate Karadarshanam. Karam is hand. Karagre Vasate Lakshmi. Here is goddess of prosperity. Now my mother, we were very poor, but we felt very prosperous inside ourselves. There is inner wealth. Does that make sense? There is that joy that we feel in ourselves, the peace that we feel in ourselves, the compassion. That is real wealth. That's wealth. So, Karagre Vasate Lakshmi. Lakshmi means goddess of prosperity. Karamule Saraswati. Here at, here at this part, the bottom of the hand, is Saraswati. Saraswati is goddess of learning. Goddess of learning. Karamadhyetu Govinda. In the center is Govinda, divinity, Krishna, in the center. Prabhate Karadarshanam. Let me look at my hand when I wake up every morning. My mother was illiterate. She didn't know how to read or write. But her heart was full. Full. That's, so I was in effect influenced by my both parents. I thank them. Very grateful to them. Uh, I thought... Mindfulness was a system of meditation. Mm -hmm. But listening to you tonight, mm -hmm. I think I heard a discussion about being mindful throughout the day yeah. and love and mm -hmm. compassion yes. and so on. Mm -hmm. uh, in contrast, uh, with transcendental meditation is mm -hmm. a practice yes. that we do for 20 minutes mm -hmm. twice a day. Right to calm the mind and mm -hmm. make us a better person. Mm -hmm. I've always heard the word mindfulness used with mm -hmm. the word meditation, mm -hmm. uh, which would not be a 24-hour practice. Mm -hmm. But listening to your talk, mm -hmm. I think you were talking to us about mindfulness throughout the day. Yes. Is, is mindfulness a, a daily way of life, yes. or is it a system of meditation? Right. So let me respond to that. I think that's a great question. There are two aspects of mindfulness. Two. One is sitting quietly, like we did for a short time, maybe 20 minutes, but sitting quietly, focusing our mind either on the breath or a mantra. Sometimes people do a mantra or rosary whatever, but being, taking, sitting quietly for 20 minutes, quieting our mind, clearing up our mind is meditation. There's guided meditation or sitting meditation. I did guided meditation, but you are also sitting, so that is sitting meditation. There are two, two systems in meditation. One comes from the yoga, which is Concentric meditation. I didn't go through that. I used the mindfulness meditation system. In yoga system is we focus our mind on a, our breath. 
and we just remain its concentration concentration when a thought comes to my mind i bring my mind back to my breath that is yoga kind of meditation mindfulness meditation is becoming mindful without judging whatever is happening in the body for example i started with the body or breath whatever arises in the mind good bad or ugly whatever doesn't matter we don't judge and slowly and gradually they fade away that is mindfulness and the second part of mindfulness is becoming mindful in everyday living so becoming mindful of my body <laughs> because i am not sitting here but i am walking am i walking mindfully am i present when i walk or am i eating mindfully i gave the examples am i eating mindfully i help my grand uh, daughter in law because she works you know in a school system and she's tired so before she comes i wash you know things that need to be washed and i do it mindfully and it brings lot of joy to me my mind is right there my mind is not there oh i wish i had read a book at this time what is this work i am doing <laughs> that's unmindfulness does that make sense the so mind i'm fully present there and the present moment is a wonderful moment it's a wonderful moment it's not tarnished or contaminated by the past or the future or by thoughts critical judgmental thoughts it's not contaminated it has its own purity so i use two things mindfulness mindfulness meditation provides a good grounding for us we become really grounded so it's wonderful i call it core practice when i teach when i teach peace education we do that with the children and say sit and the children of course cannot sit quietly for a long time because they are children right but they also learn that we can remain quiet we can close our eyes i ask the question are you here <laughs> where are you <laughs> and when child says i'm here <laughs> and narada says well i was thinking of my my dog <laughs> that's mind wandering and that happens that's fine i'm not saying don't think about dog <laughs> no we accept without judging and then slowly and gradually comes to that flow the mindfulness flow i we have a comment from online a listener in uh, Canada um wishes she could be like you. She's has has pain from an accident mm -hmm. and mm -hmm. so she she needs to do your morning mm -hmm. ritual. Mm -hmm. So she can she can be like you and in mm -hmm. that not feel the pain, not judge the pain, mm -hmm. accept it and deal with it mm -hmm. in, in your in your daily life there. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So she says thank you very much. Thank you. Um I would recommend uh, uh, all of you uh, this John Kabat-Zinn I mentioned his name he is one of the greatest uh, teachers and a professor and a researcher and a scientist and some 37 years ago uh, he was working with people who had severe physical pain for varieties of reasons and the doctor said wash their hands off i'm talking about you know massachusetts in boston and they had they said we, we cannot do anything more now <laughs> surgery is out of question <laughs> medicine is not going to work so he said send those patients to me so he worked with those patients and taught them yoga exercises stretching exercise mindfulness based stretching exercises breathing exercises meditation and support group 8 weeks and the results were outstanding so i'm talking about some 37 years ago this john kabat-zinn has blazed a trail a new trail and then now mindfulness because of his ground breaking work it's accepted some hospitals use that approach who are more open to this kind of an alternative approach 
uh, it is also used in schools and the results are outstanding the children see used in public schools in california california is more progressive in some ways i love california is more progressive and liberal <laughs> so there the in the public schools they have introduced mindfulness schools so the schools even in the prison one of my friends in san francisco he teaches mindfulness in prison in military it is being used now so i think it is wonderful to just yes, re- remain open and uh, not consider as a religion it has nothing to do with religion and my appeal to all of you is uh, you know there is a saying the old dog cannot we cannot teach old dog tricks right but my experience is that we can teach old dog new tricks so we no matter how old we are <laughs> we can always learn that of course learn that so i would appeal to you to to that thank you again very much this has been extremely uh informative i wanted to get back to your prayer with your hand yes and i wanted to ask when you say the prayer how it affects you and what it means to you can you uh, elaborate please uh, say it again when you say the prayer yes uh the one you know how does it affect you oh. each time mm-hmm. and what uh, and what does it mean to you okay very great question the prayer of the hand thank you thank you great question i am so glad that uh, you are asking that question to me and probably to others too <laughs> who may pray i think when we pray from the heart it brings lot of joyful happy grateful feelings that's what happens to me i think the prayer really opens the door for me in the morning so after doing the prayer i feel kind of fullness in me or compassion towards me and happiness inside myself and then when i you know see my grandchildren or that energy continues that's what prayer does to me so prayer is like talking to god meditation is listening to god listening to god within prayer is pray, praying to god but both of them are wonderful things to do that's my experience i think prayer meditation they really keep me on the right path keep me walking on the right path It helps me to really defog my mind <laughs> clear up my mind open up my heart and create wonderful energy thank you thank you namaste